We're joined now by Janice Mitchell Ford, who is the former chair of the Detroit Charter Revision Commission. And what role did that play? Um, it's played a significant role, I would suggest. Uh, we'll see if you agree with us. I, I know you put a lot of hard work into the Charter Revision Commission, um, but certainly uh, the name of the Charter Revision Commission came up several times uh, throughout this campaign, and particularly as it related to whether or not Mike Duggan could be on or off that ballot. Uh, as you look at it now, right. um, your thoughts? Um, I have never heard the word charter used this much ever, <laughs> um, but I counted the privilege to have been at the table when this was drafted, um, and people are reading it and they're applying it, whether rightly or wrongly, it's at play. So um, the charter is paramount, I think, at center in this election because, number one, of the whole eligibility question. This was the first time that we had a residency requirement, and the whole question was at the time of filing. Mm -hmm. Does that mean when you walk in the door to you know, file your papers, or does that mean by the filing deadline? The courts have spoken. And in their interpretation, it meant at the time of filing. Um, candidate Duggan overcame that with the right in candidacy, and so here we are today. Yeah, when, when you were putting all this together, uh, I'm sure never in your wildest dreams did you think this kind of scenario would come into play. Right. Um, no, 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 never. <laughs> and let me say this, just um, for historical context, that phrase, at the time of filing, was a carryover from the 1997 charter and the 1974 charter. The only thing that we did was we put a one-year requirement on top of that. Okay. So one year at the time of filing. Um, so when people say, what did you mean by at the time of filing, we never really discussed that part. We only discussed the one-year residency and whether that was constitutional. But looking back at um, prior court law and the way the clerk's office interpreted it prior to this recent uh, litigation, it was always considered to be the filing deadline, but the courts have spoken on this current charter, and per their interpretation, it means at the time of filing, physical filing. Well, and we're going to know that <laughs> going forward, aren't we? Exactly. So hopefully no no repeat of this. And also with the charter, then very, very important, sure. the uh, the change to council by district. Yes. Uh, that is something, Chuck, that through the polling and, uh, you know, people of Detroit they said they wanted, wanted that. Yeah. yeah. If we could just quickly kind of go through the history of sure, it. Sure, please. Um, our first city council in 1802 was at large and there were five persons appointed by the governor. Then in 1857 we went to council by districts where we had 20 aldermen from 10 districts, two from each district. As the city grew, the number of districts grew. So we then went from 20 to 42 um, and that was about 1917. And then in 1918, when we had our first home rule charter, we went back to at large. And we've been at at large since 1918 with nine city council people. We were nine when we had 100, well, 1.7 million people. We were nine, and we're nine now when we have 700,000. So the number nine has never been tied to population. It's always just been tied to how we've done it. Um, November 2009, Proposal D amended the 1997 charter to include districts. And under that charter, we had eight districts, seven with particular boundaries, and one at large. For the seven, you have one from each district, mm -hmm. and for the at large, you have two. Seven plus two is nine. We then carried that over to the 2012 charter. So now, today, for the first time in 96 years, we're voting for council by districts. And, and if the voter turnout continues to be low yeah. by the time those polls close. Uh, will you be surprised that it is low given the fact that Detroiters said they want a council by districts and that that was something that we thought yeah. would bring them out of the woodwork? Well, as you said, when we were writing charter, we couldn't imagine certain things. And emergency management <laughs> is one of those things that you just don't write charter in mind. Right. You know? And so it's not that people aren't excited about districts, but people who are coming out to vote are saying, I'm happy to be able to do this. It's that they're disenchanted. Mm. They, they feel disenfranchised. You know? It's like that old song, you know, um, Unbreak My Heart. You know, they're, just, they're just emotional about the emergency management piece. And will my vote make a difference if I elect someone who has no power? So there's a real discussion point about what authority the city council and the mayor will have under the emergency manager law. Yeah, and, and let's talk about that for yeah. a second. Uh, given the changes that you made in the charter, yes. um, for right now, uh, the, the Kevin Orr, the emergency manager, has left the council in place and yeah. left them with their salary, has left the mayor in place right. with a salary. Um, how much can he change and at what point does he run up against legal problems with the charter mm -hmm. if he tries to go beyond what he has done thus far? Okay. Um, home rule 
is where the state gives the city authority to operate under its own powers. So under the Home Rule City Act, which is a state law, it gives the city of Detroit the power to elect its mayor, power to elect the city council, and create our own charter that would provide rules for operation of government. Home rule is like parent to child. I'm the parent, you're the child. The state is the parent, <laughs> the city is the child. And state law trumps charter. So PA 436, the emergency manager law, trumps charter. And that law gives Kevin Orr, the current emergency manager, the authority to conduct all the functions of the mayor and the city council, except in one circumstance for city council. And that is the city council, well, if Kevin Orr proposes to sell a city asset for $50,000 mm -hmm. or more, and the city council says, no, we don't agree with that. Or if Kevin Orr says, I want to undo this collective bargaining agreement, this union contract, and the city council says, no, we don't agree with that then they can propose an alternative to the Emergency Loan Financial Assistance Board and say, hey, instead of selling this asset for 50, let's do this and we can still get $50,000. The loan board would look at Kevin Orr's proposal, city's council proposal, and then make a choice. That is the only situation <laughs> under which they can exercise authority without his approval. Um, having said that, the emergency manager can trump charter, he can ignore charter, but he can't change or revise charter. Right. As long as we're in receivership, he can ignore it, but he cannot go in and change it where it will be changed after he leaves. Under the Home Rule City Act, which is state law, which is not trumped by another state law, right. it will require a vote of the people. Well, and one day the emergency manager will not be here. Exactly. And so, you know, we're gonna be electing a mayor in the city of Detroit in November. That's right. And Council members and police commission. And, Let's not forget and, that. And, and police right. commission, right. Yeah. And city, city clerk, clerk. and yes. and once again, uh, those individuals we'll will be. will be running the city. It's just a matter of when. Exactly. So it's very important still who is elected into those positions. And you're preaching to the choir, and that's the yeah. sermon I've been preaching, you know, for the last couple of months about how important this election is. You know, we thought the last election was the most important election in the city. But this one is very important because whoever is in play or in place after those 18 months or whatever amount of time the uh, emergency right. manager is there, they're going to carry on where he left off. And some would say it's no better place to start with, when a, with a clean slate. And so if we have that opportunity, it's important to have good people yeah. in that place. Yeah, hindsight is always 2020. Yes. Uh, when you go back and look at what was written in terms of revision for the charter, mm -hmm. um, if there is something that just personally oh. uh, you could change, you could tweak a little bit, what would How it be? How much time do we have? <laughs> no, um. <laughs> well, is there anything that just really jumps out, given all that has happened thus far, uh, that makes you say, hmm, I wish we could have done this as opposed to that? Yes, um, especially on the fiscal and financial side. Some of the things that we've seen come in play, you know, I probably would have come in play anyway at some point, you know, so, but as far as things that we haven't seen come in play, um, looking like at the two-year budget, those things that have been implemented by Kevin Orr, we talked about that. For whatever reason, it just didn't get the votes at the table. Um, looking at reducing the number of departments, we talked about that, but politics came into play for some people and it just didn't get the votes at the table. So with this downsizing that we're going through right now in a very painful way um, could have been done via charter, but it just wasn't. So those types of things are things that I look back on and say, mm, I wish we had done it a little differently. Yeah. But right. proud of the effort overall in the document that you have, the charter that, that is going forward for the city of oh, Detroit. Oh, no question. There's some wonderful yeah. things in there. We have council by districts. Um, we have things about environment and um, recycling, mandatory recycling. We also have things in there about um, mandatory budgets and budget forecasting. So a lot of the things that Kevin Orr is trying to put in place, some of those things are already in the charter. So there is a playbook from which he can go forward. Um, so there's wonderful things in this new charter. But there are some things that have created some controversies. Sure. Um, and, and some tweaking can be done, no question about it. Yeah, yeah. As you look toward next year, we're going into a gubernatorial election yes. year. Yes. Uh, I know that the city charter is not going to have any direct effect on that, uh, but just hearing about what you're hearing from people in, in, in the city of Detroit, uh, what do you think you're, we're going to be looking at in terms of uh, all the different uh, dynamics in place? Well, that's a loaded question, Chuck. <laughs> um, it will be a very interesting discussion, um, especially surrounding this whole emergency management law and seemingly the movement in the current legislature um, to just 
move forward with things that people are not necessarily in favor of. So I think personally what you're going to see in this next election is people who are not necessarily partisan, but who may be crossing the aisle for another candidate just because of issues. Um, when it comes to pension issues, right, you know, and taxing pensions, right. that's not a Republican or a Democrat issue. No, that's a money issue. You know, issue. that's a money issue. And for people who are Republican, they may cross the aisle on that just because it hit their, their bottom pocket. Um, so, you know, I think it's going to be an interesting race to watch because people have as far as the emergency manager law. You know, they voted to change it, then it was changed back. Right. You know, so we're gonna see how all that plays out on a municipal level from not only cities, but with the schools, you know, and how that's been playing itself off with Buena Vista and how they were closed down for budgetary issues and all that. So it's gonna be very interesting to watch. Well, certainly it's gonna be a referendum on Rick Snyder one way or another. No question about know, it. Within the city of Detroit anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. relative to the gubernatorial race. Right, which, uh, and, and how it plays in Detroit may play totally different right. uh, outside of the city of Detroit, maybe a complete opposite situation. Right. Um, and some of the things that he's trying to do with the city of Detroit may actually um, buster his position. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting times to watch all around the city right now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it should be. Um, as, you, as you go back to the law firm um, uh, over at Clark Hill, yes. uh, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of talk there because of all the uh, legal challenges. Yeah. When you look at the the fact that there's going to be challenges because of the right in vote here, right. uh, is that something that your office is going to get involved with? Not you directly, but others there. Um, I don't know the answer to that question because we don't know, you know, which parties are in play and the type of thing. So I, I can't say one way or the other. Um, but I do expect there to be legal challenges. <laughs> and one thing about you know this charter, um, one thing about what's going on right now with city bankruptcy, is we are in unchartered yes. territory. Yeah. And what's being created is legal precedent. And as a lawyer, it's just exciting, whether you're on this side or that side, because these are issues of first impression for the court that they've never had to deal with before. So whatever your position is, right or wrong, we're creating history here on a legal level, which is exciting. And then for someone like me who's a policy wonk, it's exciting because people are looking at Detroit like we've never done before. Well, I mean, New York, internationally, CNN, absolutely. all because of Because we're not the last city no, that, is, the that is going to uh, go through the financial difficulties and maybe have to go the Chapter 9 bankruptcy right. route and maybe have to, uh, again, enter these uncharted waters. Yeah, we're the first yeah. largest, but right. definitely not the last. And so we're setting precedent, as Detroit has always done, you know, whether it was in automotive world or in music, you know, we're setting the way this way. So it's an exciting position. People said, Janice, the day we filed bankruptcy was the saddest day in our history. Well, I disagree with that. One of our saddest days was probably the riots. But for me, this is an opportunity for a clean slate, right? right? So I'm, like, I'm pretty excited about our future. You know, it's districts, um, all of that, it's just really, really a good opportunity for us if we seize it. Well, and we've done so many stories, you know, Chuck, as you know, with uh, what's happening downtown and yeah. in Midtown mm -hmm. and, and, and the vibrancy there and the new businesses and the people moving in. But still, and, and that's why I'm so happy to see the council by district as well, yeah. the neighborhoods mm -hmm. are, are stressed. You know, there are problems. And so right. to have that direct representation, someone that you as a resident can hold accountable, right. uh, you know, I, I think at this time in Detroit's history, that's really, really important going forward. No question. And people have asked the question, well, under the current, char under the 2012 charter, will a district city council person have less authority or, um, you know, than a at-large person? And the answer to that is no, because they vote on everything that comes before the council. Their focus is their neighborhood, but they would also have the same vote on tax breaks for downtown stadium, as well as the at-large person would have the same vote on community development in District 2 or District 5. So I think it's going to create a um, diversity on the council as far as ethnic and race, but also perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's not coming from one perspective. They're coming from several different ones. So I think it's going to be a good thing. Change is not easy. No. You know, but no. It's, it's often necessary. All right. And, and we are seeing a lot of change. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll determine later whether or not it's been good. Uh, and in some ways it will probably be good. Some ways it may not be good. But exactly. uh, either way, uh, it's going to be interesting to watch the entire interesting process. Interesting to watch. I'm going to have a big bucket of popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got, the, you've got a front row seat for it. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for coming in Thank and giving us your me. insight and all awesome. the experience that you've Thank had you so there. Much. We really appreciate it. All right. And we are going to.